Welcome to a conversation with Brian. Tonight's guest, Dr. Don Parker. Dr. Parker believes in creating a school climate in which the entire staff goes above and beyond to meet the academic and social emotional needs of all students. He has presented throughout the United States at the top education conferences, including the Every Student Succeeds Act Conference, the Staff Development for Educators, and the National Principals Conference. Dr. Parker is a professional development provider and conducts workshops titled The Power of Building Trusting Relationships with Students at Risk and Implementing a Resilience Program for Students at Risk. And so without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Don Parker to a conversation with Brian. Don, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. How you doing this evening? I am doing well. Oh my goodness, look at that Jordan. Somebody's a Chicago Bulls. Absolutely. Man. I'm raised on the south side of Chicago. Grew up watching Michael Jordan, and you know what? If I could be like Mike, bro, what <laughs> <I'm gonna say? laughs> I think I think you're on your way, my brother. Hey, um, you know, one of the things that we've been been doing over the last couple of weeks is communicating back and forth, and I think you know now my my best friend and college roommate and teammate Mike Brown played with Jordan for those mm-hmm. first two years, and then he played with the Jazz for five years. He had an eleven year career, but I remember those days fondly. Um, unfortunately, he did not play with Jordan when they won the championship, but uh, uh, he has some fine memories of playing with Jordan and Pippen and, and Grant and, and Oakley and, and all those guys. And so um, yeah, I appreciate those videos that you shared with me. Yeah. 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 Uh, there, you know, being, being uh, an athlete and being in sports, there's always this connection, right? Absolutely. At, like a, a natural connection. It yeah. just never goes away. Exactly. Hey, Don, uh, again, thanks for joining me. I am so happy that you're here. Uh, We're going to hear a little bit about your book and about you. Um, As I start each one of my my, uh, conversation with Brian um, sessions, I ask my my guest to talk a little bit about their personal journey, their their professional story, um, so our audience can see and understand who you are. So who is Don Parker? Why are you an educator? Well, you know what, Brian? Um, I noticed when I was growing up in high school is actually when I decided that I wanted to go into teaching because I had such a great connection with my PE teachers Mm -hmm. and they just seemed like so laid back, but also just so impactful, you know, with what they shared, you know, with their students in their classes. Sure. So I had a really great connection with my high school PE teacher and I just started asking, you know, how did you become a PE teacher? And then he told me his journey on how he became a PE teacher. And I was like, you know, I can see myself doing that because I love sports. Right. And I love working with kids. And so uh, when I went away to college, I majored in physical education. And when I would come home over the summer, I would have to take some jobs in order to earn some money and put some money in my pocket. So the summer job that I took was being a day camp recreational supervisor. So I worked in the Chicago uh, public parks, working as a rec leader. And I remember like when I finally finished college and I was applying for jobs to be a a PE teacher in Chicago. And I went on that first interview and the principal said, hey, Don, you're gonna be perfect for this position because you play college sports and high school sports and you have experience teaching sports skills. He was like, right now, the PE teachers that we have, they kind of just roll out the ball (laughs) and just let the kids hoop. He was like, you're gonna bring some fidelity to the program. Sure. And so I was like, awesome. And so I remember uh, he said, well, you hired for the job. We're looking forward to you bringing some fidelity to our program and really teaching our students skills. And when I went to teacher orientation, he told me to show up two weeks later for teacher orientation. So I came back with teacher orientation. And you know how you learn about how to use the copy machines and you know what the <laughs> yep. is and things <laughs> like that. I remember those days, yep. Those days. And so the time came where they gave every new teacher their schedule for the upcoming semester. And when he gave me my schedule, I looked at, it was all health classes on the schedule, Brian. (laughs) So no no PE. No PE. And so I said, (laughs) I need to talk to him about this. Because my mind shift was, my mind was like, hey, I'm teaching PE, I'm teaching skills, I'm getting ready to teach, you know, basketball, flag football, floor hockey, I was ready. And so 
when I looked at the schedule and there were no PE classes, I said, <clears throat> I said, excuse me, Mr. Principal. I was intimidated because the principal <laughs> powerful guy, you know, rule of iron fist. Yeah. And uh, he was like, yeah, well, how can I help you? I was like, you know what? We spoke about me teaching PE classes and teaching sports skills in a gym because that's what my strengths are. Right. And he said, I know. He's like, but no other teachers wanted to teach health because they don't like doing the lesson plans. They don't like preparing lessons. They don't like grading papers and things like that. And you rookie, know, rookie. <laughs> right, right. He's like, frankly, you know, they don't have the classroom management to do it. Right. He's like, you have it on your endorsement. And so it's on you. And so he said, but there's one thing I forgot to tell you. I'm like, what? He's like, there's something that's called seniority. He said, and you, my friend, are the lowest on the totem pole. <laughs> if no one else wants it, it's on you. So I took that health curriculum. I went back to my lab, you know, AKA my basement, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I started working on my health lesson plans. And when I got in that classroom, Brian, like within, you know, two to three months, the students would come up to me and say, hey, Coach Parker, I really appreciate that lesson that we did on self-esteem because, you know, I wasn't feeling great about myself when I compare right. myself to other people. And um, then, you know, they would say, hey, I really appreciate the lesson that we did on how to build our self-esteem by writing a list of the 10 things we love most about ourselves and then writing down what our life goes and, you know, what we felt our purpose was in life. They said, now I feel a lot better about myself. And you taught me how comparison is the thief of joy. And so now I don't compare myself to anybody. I just, you know, stay in my lane. I do me and I appreciate myself for the skills that I have. And so this would happen all the time where kids would come up to me with these messages. And so at the end of the year, you know, I noticed like I'm really making a difference in these students' lives. Right. So when the, the principal came back to me at the end of the year, it's like, hey, Don, guess what? We have an opening in PE because one of the coaches left because he's taking a job at another school where he's going to be the head coach. He's like, I have a whole a whole classroom schedule full of PE classes. I'm like, you know what, boss? You can give me a couple, but really, I want to stay in this health classroom because I feel like I'm making a difference in students' lives. That is awesome. Then, that's why I learned how to teach kids. Um, social and emotional learning skills, how to teach them how to make healthy choices. And that just, you know, that health curriculum has a lot to do with social and emotional learning. Yeah. So I found, I found the strength that I, I discovered a strength that I didn't know I had. Yeah. That's why I was teaching students how to make healthy choices. And that's just carried me throughout my career to where I am now. You know, you know, Don, I'm going to pop your, your uh, book up on the screen. Let me know if you can see it. Um, but I, th I think one of the things that really, you know, fascinated me. Can you see it now? Oh, yeah, I see that. Yeah. There it so, is. There you know, this, everybody, this is Don's book, Building Bridges, Engaging Students at Risk Through the Power of Relationships. And, you know, one of the things that I heard when you were kind of telling your story was that it wasn't just the curriculum. It truly was making connections, you know, building those relationships. And so can you talk a little bit about, about this as we segue into it? Can you talk a little bit about why it's so important for um, teachers to build relationships with students? All right, because you know what? To be honest with you, uh, when you are building relationships with students, uh, they just have more reason to, to learn. They want to learn because they really appreciate that relationship that they have with you. Yeah. So when you have that relationship, even it not only benefits the students, of course it benefits the students, but it also benefits the teacher in so many ways. Like it cuts down on discipline problems. It helps you present the content in a way that students will want to learn it. Yeah. And what it does is it just is that rewarding feeling that you have as a teacher, as an educator, that you're really connecting with these students, finding out what's going on in their lives and building those meaningful relationships and making those connections with students. And would you say that, you know, relationships, especially positive student teacher relationships, and you said something about in terms of that feeling that you get, um, it, it really does stimulate kind of this 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 emotion of helping motivate kids. Because if 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 you have a positive relationship with a student and they like you, they feel like they they're liked, then they're gonna want to do the, they're gonna want to do anything for you. Yeah, you're exactly right. And then uh, when you go a step beyond that, what you find is that you're not only helping the student, you're not only helping the student be a successful student at, you know, doing the classroom work and, you know, mastering the content, but you're actually helping that student be successful in life. Yeah. They ain't looking up to you as a role model. And so it's easier to get through to them. And then they open up to you. They let you know what's going on inside their lives. 
and they really appreciate you for taking more of an interest in their personal life as opposed to just making sure that they're a successful student. And so what the research says is when they interview students from an affluent background, they ask them, what kind of teacher do you need to be successful? All right, resoundingly, the student said, we need a teacher who's gonna push us to get ready for college and careers. Right. However, when they interview students from low socioeconomic class or you know, middle-class families, they said, what kind of teacher do you need in order to be successful? Overwhelmingly, the students responded, I need a teacher who I know cares about me. Yeah. And so what the research says, we have to combine both because we have to have high expectations for our students, but that caring piece is so important. In, you know, when I was uh, starting my career and I've been in education for, for you know, over 34 years, when I started my career, I would have, you know, the, the older teachers would always, you know, kind of harken back to the olden days and they would say, in my day, the kids wouldn't disrespect me. Why aren't their parents teaching them this? And so, you know, how do you, you know, help teachers stop tape taking um, disrespect from students and insubordination from students personally? Okay, well, you know what? What, what you have to realize, I can use an analogy of a person like a bully, all right? What we all know about bullies is that bullies, they have something that's insecure about themselves. Right. So in order to hide their own insecurities, they try to point out imperfections of other people. And what that does is make them feel better about themselves or make them look better in the light of other people. All right. So um, challenging students, it's the same thing where they have some insecurity about themselves. Right. All right. And so what they do is they may disrespect their teacher or you know, get into conflicts with other students. But what it is, it's something that's inside of them that it's that inner turmoil that they have that haven't been worked out yet. And so when the student disrespects a teacher, you know, the teacher shouldn't take it personal, all right? Because it's not anything that the teacher is doing wrong unless the teacher, you know, really did humiliate the student or, you know, disrespect the student in some sort of way. But nine times out of 10, it's something that's internally that's going on with that student. So I like to share the Q-tip principle. And so the Q-tip principle is an acronym. And what it stands for is quit taking it personal. Because when you take it personal, yeah. you carry around that weight, you, add, you question yourself, you question your efficacy, and you do yourself a, a really disservice when you think that there's something wrong with you as opposed to thinking, hey, there's something wrong with that student. I'm not going to take it personal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to help this student. Right. But when you don't take it personal, you're willing to help that student by giving them whatever social and emotional support they need you know, having those conversations, building that student's self-esteem, building that student's self-worth, building that student's value. And yeah. then next thing you know, the, the disrespect will stop. Right. However, we won't do that unless we stop taking it personal. Yeah. And one of the things I, I heard you say, and I think it's really important, what I've realized over my last, you know, you know, 30 years as an educator, is that, you know, when a student lacks academic skills, we as educators teach them those skills. When a student lacks social skills, emotional skills, behavioral skills, we tend to punish. And, and, and you know, those skills aren't intuitive. Kids have to have be taught those skills and model those skills. You're absolutely right. And so just like a teacher comes into the classroom and they say, I'm a math teacher, I shouldn't have to teach respect. And they're all prepared to teach their math. Right. But if you know you have students with behavior issues and you want to increase the respect that's shown to you, then what you have to do is also go in there with a plan to teach those behaviors. Yeah. You have to actually put some thought into it and, 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 and teach it. And so the line, treat others the golden rule, treat others how they want to be treated. All right, that works in a lot of cases. However, some of these students haven't been taught respect. Right. And so what we have to do as teachers and educators is move beyond the golden rule and take it up a notch to the platinum rule. Teach and we have to treat students how they need to be treated. That's what the platinum rule says. Right. Teach other, treat others how they need to be treated so they can uh, progress and grow in that area. And that's that idea of kid by kid, skill by skill. So you really have to know that kid and not just blanket and say all kids need to be treated the same way. We need to know where that kid's coming from, that kid's frame of reference, you know, how that kid, um, you know, and again, it's not to lower expectations because kids are coming from certain families, but it gives us context on how to plan to work with that child. You're absolutely right. And so what I call it, Brian, is I call it the if-then-when plan. 
okay? So when we walk into classrooms, you have to expect that some type of disruption or student misbehavior is gonna, is gonna happen. Right. So it's not a matter of if it's gonna happen, it's a matter of when it's gonna happen. Right. And the, the, the then part of it is then, what am I going to do when it happens in order to extinguish the fire and move on with you know, my lesson and engaging our students? Yeah. You know, Don, over the last two and a half years, we've had you know, so much stress um, with the pandemic, you know, our, our, the, the social justice movement, everything that's happening um, in our in our world, and so you know, you know, we've heard this this term S C L S E L S E L social emotional learning, and so some teachers will say, as and you mentioned this before, you know, I'm here to teach reading, I'm here to teach math, I'm here to teach P E. I don't know how to teach, or I don't. I, I, it's not my job to teach, you know, social emotional skills or these behaviors, and I, and I know that um, sometimes people say that because they don't have the skills, they don't have the tools to be able to do that, right? And so, what are some different ways that schools can provide social emotional learning, and why is it so important that they provide it now? How how do we put some tools into our toolkit if teachers don't know how to do it? Okay, well. I, I'm a firm believer in professional development yeah. and uh, especially the professional development that's, that teachers need now. And so a part of it is uh, teachers knowing their own emotions and controlling their own emotions. Well, how did you learn how to control your emotions? All right, what, what kind of lessons did you learn? What kind of experiences that, did you have where you learned the importance of managing your emotions and how to respond to different situations? And then think those through, because really uh, everything that happens with students is a teachable moment. Yeah. And so we have to go beyond the teachable moment and we have to do what I call a lovable moment where we have to I take like the that. time to care about our students, to, to let them know that we care about them and say, OK, all right, instead of sending this kid out to class, all right, I'm going to set a few minutes aside to just talk about this situation that happened, let the student know how they should have responded to avoid the conflict or avoid the problem. Let them, know, let them understand the connections between uh, actions and consequences, sure. actions and rewards, right. and talk them through a scenario. All right, teachers are, are, are good at doing that because they've had these experiences themselves. Mm -hmm. right. what, what, what else what teachers can do is sign up for a professional development on how to teach those social emotional learning skills, how to teach students how to be aware of their behavior, how to give them uh, tools to uh, calm down, center themselves, ground themselves. Even something as simple as teaching the students how to ask for a timeout or how to ask for you know, quiet time so that they can go and manage their emotions. All right, work closely with that social worker. What I did at my school is we came up with a trauma-informed plan okay. where the social worker would come into our staff meetings and she would be given like 20 minutes on our agenda to talk to the staff about ways they can uh, work with students to help them manage those emotions and teach those social emotional learning skills. Yeah, I think it's it's so important, you know, what you just said is with the social worker talk to the entire staff, because I think it's really important for there to be common language, common knowledge and common expectations staff wide, because if one teacher has one expectation and, 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 and treats students in a certain way, not to say you have to treat you know, not to say that teachers can't have their own personalities, but there has to be some consistency in the way we respond to kids, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that that's extremely important. And and kind of segueing into that idea of, you know, teachers and looking at us um, as educators, this idea of mental health, you know, we've heard a lot about self-care lately in the last couple of years because of the stress. Um, you know, what do you say to teachers to to help them understand that they need to take care of themselves because you, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? And and it's also important to understand that if you're an, an escalated adult, cannot help an escalated kid. And so, how do you how do you help teachers understand? And and what do you say to them in terms of the idea of their mental health, their their well being? Well, when we when we came back to um, remote learning after the first shutdown, all right? So the teachers were fearful, they had anxiety about coming into the building because uh, our district, we had, uh, instead of teachers working from home through remote learning, they had to work from the classroom. Right. And so we noticed the anxiety they had just coming into the building. Sure. And then that got heightened 
when the students were allowed to come back. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so I'm noticing my staff. And so when I see my staff, you know, me having a relationship with them, because just as I'm a believer in having strong relationships, you know, teacher student relationships, I am also as much of an advocate as principals having strong relationships with their teachers. Right. And so I would see a teacher and I would ask, hey, how are you doing? And they would say, fine. But, you know, we're having a discernment and really knowing the teacher, you know that they're really not fine. You know, they weren't okay. You know, they're not okay. And right. fine is an acronym for feelings inside not expressed. And so I would put my, my hand on her shirt. I said, how are you really doing? Let's go to my office and have a talk. Right. And so I keep a box of Kleenex right there on my, on my desk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we talk and the, the conversation uh, goes to a place where the teacher is really, you know, sharing what's going on with them. And yeah. so I developed a professional, develop, a professional development for my teachers where I focused on their mental health. And so I took my teachers through a series of, you know, um, trainings on how to do self-care. And so what I did, I took that and I turned that into a workshop and it's called burning up instead of burning out. And so what it does is it gives teachers all kinds of tips on how they can improve their physical, intellectual, and emotional health. And so you're right. So expecting a teacher to show up to work and they've experienced trauma, they're having difficult times in their life, you know, to tell them to just leave the baggage at the door and show up and teach. That's just like telling a kid who had adverse childhood experiences yep. to just show up, sit down and learn. All right. It doesn't work. All right. You're not going to be productive. So absolutely. Teachers have to understand the importance of uh, promoting wellness within themselves, making themselves a priority and doing what it takes so they can be healthy because stressed out teachers make stressed out students. Yeah. However, healthy teachers promote healthy students. And that's what we want to see. How can teachers develop empathy? I mean, that's a word we hear a lot lately. I mean, how can they develop empathy and show empathy to students who are struggling either socially or emotionally or academically? You know what, you, you have to have empathy. Um, and sometimes, you know, it can be somewhat taxing. And I look at this through the lens of, like you said before, where we were going through the pandemic and we had so many uh, social unrest issues and things like that. Yeah. My little brother is a Chicago policeman. And he said after the George Floyd incident, how just the public at large was just disrespecting police. Right. And he, he'd had several instances of disrespect when he went on calls and things like that. It was like people lost respect for the police. And so he said, Don, how do you handle this? Like you did, you work in a, in a neighborhood where some of your parents can be disrespectful, be a little bit uncouth. How do you deal with it? Don't you just have that low tolerance for ignorance where you just want to, you know, keep it moving? And I'm like, well, I said, would you rather be the doctor or be a patient? And he's like, well, what you mean? What you talking about? Right. He said, well, think about it. Would you be rather be the one with the problem or be the person that's helping the person with the problem? And one of my favorite cartoon uh, superheroes is Spider-Man. Okay. The reason why, not because his last name is Parker, you know, he's Peter Parker, <laughs> you know he could say because. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in that movie, they talk about how he who is, uh, who has much, much is also required. Right. And so we have to be servant leaders in this aspect. And we have to understand what our students' issues are, understand that they have problems. And trauma-informed education teaches us not to ask what's wrong with the student, but ask what happened to the student. Yeah. And once we ask what happens to them, then we come from an approach where, wow, you know, we really want to help you. And that has, that's how you develop empathy for students. It's just understanding that as servant leaders, you know, as, as teachers, as administrators, we're in a position to help them. And so we should take advantage of the opportunity to help our students and, and have empathy for what, what happened to them or what they're going through. Perfectly said. You know, I, I, I totally agree with what you said 100%. The other piece that I, I have encountered over my 30 some years is this this wall that a number of students put up that mm. come in and they are like, you know, they have like a big callus around them or big, big bubble because they don't want to let anybody in. And so, you know, how can you break down that wall that a lot of students put up so they can avoid those relationships with some of the teachers? Because, and it takes time, right? I mean, because there is a wall because of what's happened to them outside of school. You, you're absolutely right. And that's another thing where teachers can't take it personal. Um, you know, a story that relates to that is when I was a 
PE teacher, my colleague, we called him Chip, because Chip was always chipper. We nicknamed him Chip. <laughs> he was always chipper, always in a great mood. Yeah. So uh, one day he came to work, you know, and, you know, he was like down and, and out, just wasn't himself. And so, you know, of course, me, you know, having a relationship with him, hey, you know, Chip, what's going on? Right. Then he told me how he was going through a divorce with his wife and how the divorce would make it final, how she won custody and how he was hurt. And he said, man, I'm, I'm never going to be in a relationship, you know, with another woman again. He's like, because I don't want to hurt like this again. So I'm not going to yeah. open up and be in a relationship because this pain is too bad. And I really told him, I said, you know, um, you really shouldn't generalize women like that. And, you know, we're made for relationships. Right. And what you're going to do is rob a woman of having a healthy relationship with you. And you're going to rob yourself of the joy of having a relationship with another woman. I said, so you can't hold, you know, you can't hold against all women what happened with you in this relationship. I, I, you know, I empathize with you. You know, I, I know how you feel, but really, happily over time, you'll think about that and you'll, you know, revisit that. And so really what happens is with at-risk students, they've been hurt in the past yeah. and they don't want to be hurt again. And so they put up a wall to avoid that relationship because they don't want the letdown. So it's like, if you don't get excited for something, then you don't get disappointed when it doesn't happen. Right. And so right. A lot of students, they, some of them have that experience, but then a lot of them also, they don't put up a wall just to keep people out. They really put up a wall to see who cares enough to break that wall down. Mm. Who's going to really yeah. invest in this relationship? Who do yeah. I know is once they break this wall down that they won't run out on me because they was committed to this relationship because of the work that they put into it. They don't want to be abandoned anymore. It's not that they don't, it's not that they don't want relationships. It's right. that they don't want abandonment. They don't want the hurt or they don't want the letdown. Yeah. From when an adult lets them down. It's kind of like, you know, you're setting yourself up. They don't want to set themselves up for this, you know, the, what they would hope to happen, but it doesn't happen. And they've probably, as you kind of alluded to, they've probably been disappointed so many times in their lives that now they have this wall and they're like, I, I, I can't do this again because it's so painful. You're absolutely right. And so then, you know, the student experienced so much joy when you do use these methods to break down that wall and to build that relationship with them. And then to, to let you know about my friend Chip, you know, after several years, he did get involved in another relationship and now is happily married again. Okay, you know, with, yeah. with the woman of his dreams. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we can break down that wall, soften students' hearts, let them know that we're gonna be there for them. And then the investment that we make in students, you know, it, it pays off. It may not work right at that time, but right. it does pay off. You know, let's let's turn to um, administrators. You know, we've talked about teachers. We've talked about students. Uh, what in your work, when you're working with school leaders and administrators, what are you um, what are you focused on in terms of their their self care, their relationships with their staff? You know, it's not unlike a teacher's relationship with students, but you know, what are you sharing with them? Because administrators are, uh, you know, under enormous pressure now, mm -hmm. enormous pressure. And so what do you say to those administrators in terms of, you know, how can they make sure that they're okay? Well, you know what? You're right. As administrators, we get paid to play, to be cool and calm. Absolutely. You know, we have to respond how in the correct way when there's a crisis. But we're human. And we don't always respond in the correct way. I, I, I know I didn't. I never always. I, I wasn't perfect. I made a lot of mistakes. And, and, and I was an administrator pre-pandemic. I retired in 2017. You have mm -hmm. all this other stuff on top of it now. Hey, I raised my hand, too. I, I made a lot of mistakes. Still making them. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Constantly. <laughs> but, but, but just like, you know, uh, students need someone to talk to. Teachers need someone to talk to. Uh, administrators, they have to have you know, a web of support where, you know, they're vulnerable enough. A lot of us want to, you know, wear a mask and make people think that everything is okay and we got all our stuff together. Yeah. But the truth is, sometimes we also have internal struggles. Sometimes we also have self-doubt and sometimes we also get overwhelmed, all right? So what we have to do is, you know, maintain that mental health and physical health, you know, so our body can withstand the rigor of the workday and then also know how to center ourselves. We have to, just like we tell uh, students, recognize those emotional cues when you're about to get angry 
or when you feel stressed and when you feel like you're going to, you know, lose it, you have yep. to recognize those cues. And then you have to have a, a place that you can go to, to recenter yourself and calm yourself. Yeah. And so uh, teachers have to have, I mean, administrators also have to have that safe space, that trusted colleague that they talk about, a mentor, yeah. all right, that they can go to. And hey, you know what? This is what I've experienced. And sometimes that person may not even be able to give them a solution. But sometimes it's just having that listening ear yep. where we support one another just by listening and letting them know, hey, it's going to be all right. And giving the affirmation, hey, you've got this. You're going to get through this successfully. Exactly. Absolutely. I think it's so important for everybody to have somebody to be able to turn to um, because we're not perfect. Like, as you said, you make mistakes, I make mistakes, and it's okay. If that's part of, you know, we want to model, I think, for, for teachers, and we want teachers to model for students that making mistakes is part of the teaching learning process. It's part of the growth mindset process. And, but, and it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to, at times, in front of your staff, for me, to say, I, I don't know how to do this. I'm sure some of my staff members may know how to do something, you know, more effectively than I. And I think taking some of the pressure off of ourselves as administrators by being vulnerable actually helps us with credibility. You, you're exactly right. Because to be honest with you, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're champion, you know, where we are right now, as far as putting in more hours and, yeah. you know, uh, skipping lunch and things like that. And they wear it like it's a badge of honor. Yeah. And they the saying that says a good leader is like a candle. They burn themselves out uh, in order to light the way for others. All right. But the truth is, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to eat healthy. We have to exercise. We have to have someone to talk to, to blow off our stress. We have to get enough sleep, you know. And I was caught in a rut like that at a time in my life where I was just working hours on top of hours yeah. and other things were being neglected. And what that did was exasperate some of the health and mental stress that I was feeling. Sure. And so the work is going to be there. That's why it's a job. Yeah. That work is going to be there. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to give yourself a break when you need it and then just come back to it. I heard uh, one of my, uh, you know, colleagues and, and, you know, people I respect highly, uh, Anthony Muhammad had said one time, he says, we have to sometimes get over ourselves. I mean, we sometimes we, we think a little bit too highly of ourselves as as educators and administrators. So we, we have to have confidence, but we have to get over ourselves and, and, and not think that we're the only people who can do this job. You're right. exactly right. And, so, oh, and, and, and you said it right there. Like, good leaders, they would delegate. They would yep, build the capacity exactly. of their staff. Yep. You can't do everything. A good yep. leader builds the capacity in others to help them believe in themselves. Exactly. And so you're right. When it's some task that you can delegate, and you you do have to get over that, that thinking that, you know, if you want something done right, do it yourself. That's true. But it's kind of not true because some other people can actually knock that task out for you as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or even more effectively, right? And you're uh, absolutely right. Now I'm going to pop your your book back up on the the screen because I just want to. I really like the um, the cover, and I, I think you know one of the things I I just wanted you to share is, um, what were you thinking about when you when you talk about building bridges and it, that's really about you know making connections and building relationships. But I like the cover because it really is is a visual that shares what we need to do to actually make a connection. Absolutely. You know what? I work with the design team at Solution Tree who published the book. And they just took what I described to them, what I wanted to uh, happen as a result of people reading the book is make that connection, bridge the gap. And so that bridge is the gap between where some of our students are and where the teacher is and now together we can walk in that bridge and bridge that gap and do what it takes in order to make that connection so that we can build trust and relationships with our at-risk students and especially those students that put up a wall we are bridging the gap so we can let the students know that you know we believe in them we believe in their abilities we value them and we're here for you to help you be successful absolutely absolutely um we have a few minutes left. I, I had a couple more questions before I ask um, my final question. But one of the things that I've um, really experienced over my career is this idea that students um, believe the labels that we give them. 
And we as educators, I don't think we do it on purpose, but the, and this has to do with relationships. We mm -hmm. as educators sometimes give students labels or we, we you know, say things to other educators and then we act out those labels and lower our expectations. Mm -hmm. How do you help educators understand the power that they have in terms of their words and relationships mm -hmm. and that negative labels lower expectations like, you know, low achiever or my, 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 you know, low students or, or, you know, my, 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 my poor students, when you use those words, it gets into your psyche. And you know what? You don't Ryan, you're exactly right. And I remember coming back from the pandemic to in-person learning this year, beginning of this year. And so the teachers were very overwhelmed because they knew that from what most data said that the students were two years below grade level. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to you know, teach our students and, you know, get them to meet the standards and get them back on level. And they actually didn't believe that they could do it. Yeah. So I told them the story about um, my mom. She was a realtor. Okay. So uh, my mom was a single mom. She raised me and my three siblings. And so she took extra jobs just to make sure we had enough. Right. So during the day, she was a school treasurer. She also did taxes during tax season. And wow. in the evenings, she worked as a realtor. All right, she had that hustle. I think that's why I inherited a lot of it from. Yeah, it's, it was modeled for you. It was modeled for me. Yeah. So, uh, but one thing, she was bad with keys. And so I told my, my teachers the story at the beginning of the school year. So when we would go to see these homes, all right, she would have to open a lockbox and then take the key and open a door mm -hmm. to the homes. And so she struggled so much when it came to using that key and opening the door because a lot of these homes were old homes and a lot of those keys just it's not like you could just slide it in and right open it. right so uh one particular day you know in chicago it's cold it's windy it was in the middle of the winter we had to go to this house and show her clients that the home and so she went ahead of the clients to open the door but she could not get that key to work wow. and and so during this time we didn't have cell phones right so we're in the car waiting for her to open the door so we can go into the house so all of a sudden we see her coming back to the car and she told her clients to just wait a little bit. And so as mm -hmm. she came back to the car, she drove to the nearest payphone. She called the realty office and she was like, hey, I cannot get this key to work. You know, are we sure that this is the right key? For right. This and the, the realtor office said, hey, you know, we have quality control, check all the keys. So yes, the key does, does work. Right. And so her knowing the knowledge that the key worked, then she figured, okay, I can, this key is going to work. I can jiggle it. You know, I might have to, you know, turn it a little bit harder. I might have to, you know, play with it a little bit. I might have to finagle. But it she work. believed that the key worked, that it worked. And then, so with her, but knowing that it was the right key, and she was able to open the door and, and successfully get into the house and show her clients the home. Yeah. Get back in that nice warm house and, and show the clients <laughs> the home. Yeah. So the point is, is I told my teachers, you have to believe in yourself that you can grow these students that you can't educate. You have to not only believe that you are the key, you have to believe that you can unlock these students' minds. You might have to finagle what you're doing. Yep. You might have to adjust. You might have to you know, uh, use a variety of methods in order to, to, to make your teaching techniques work or your strategies work or whatever, but you are the key. Yeah, so by me telling you that, doesn't that help you believe in yourself that you have that teacher efficacy to yep. move the meeting with your students? I say it's the same thing. When you go back, and, and, and talk to your students, you have to let them know that every single one of them is going to be successful because you're there to support them. Yeah. All right, let them know that you believe in, th in them. Let them know that they're capable. Let them know that they're smart. Let them know that they will grow because of effort and perseverance. And you model that for them. You give them this, effort, uh, this affirming message every day until they start believing it in themselves. Yeah. And so yes, teachers have to relay that they believe in their students and their abilities. I love that analogy of your mom. And it really is all about expectations and beliefs, expectations mm -hmm. and beliefs. And, and, and you were right. You're absolutely right, Don. It's not so much about my expectations and beliefs of the kid. It's my expectations and beliefs of my, of me, of me being able to do it. Once I have that, that the, the, the competence 
then I'll gain the confidence to be able to make sure that I give every single kid the confidence to be able to believe that they're gifted and that they can do anything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, because what, what does it say if a teacher really mm -hmm. doesn't believe that they're going to make a difference in the outcome of their students' academics or behavior? Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're just going through the motions. You're exactly. right. So yeah. if you don't believe in your abilities, then ab absolutely you're going to uh, unconsciously relay that same belief exactly. onto your students that they're not capable, that they're not able. So part of you know teachers growing students is teachers have to believe, hey, you know what? I'm capable. Yep. I'm constantly strengthening my weaknesses. I'm constantly making myself better. So therefore I can make my students better. Exactly. Hey, before we wrap up, I'm going to share with you one more thing. Um, you have some things coming up um, on the screen. Uh, you have something coming up on April 26th, I see. Whoops, I think I, I shared the wrong thing. Let me make sure I have the... That's it. I see it. There you go. Yeah. And so you, you have... Uh, talk to us a little bit about this. What's coming up for you? All right. So this is an administrative academy of all educators or administrators in Illinois. They have to take what you call an administrative academy uh, once a year. Okay. And so I developed this administrative academy where... Uh, principals and assistant principals and other administrators can come to my uh, administrators academy or workshop so that they can learn how to build trust and relationships with their students so they can in turn take what I've taught them back to their staff so they can teach their staff techniques and give them tools for their toolbox on how they can build relationships with students and so uh, administrators they get administrative academy credit for taking a workshop and teachers it's also open for teachers Teachers can come and get this workshop and they can get CEUs and they can get credit towards their professional development for signing up for my workshop. Awesome. Awesome. And that's one of many. Uh, I wish I would have shared. I know, I know you're, I know you're, like, you're hustling. I, I see you on social media and you're, you're all over the place. You're doing a lot of great things, my friend. Um, I appreciate it, Brian. And so are you, my friend. You are like using this platform and you are empowering other educators and people through this platform. So I, I really thank you for the work that you do and then also for having me as well. No, I appreciate it. One of the things that I, you know, over this last two and a half years or especially over the last year, um, because educators are, are, are so stressed and educators are, are feeling so beat down by all different factors of our society. I was like, you know, we have so many great people in our profession. We have so many great things that are going on. And so instead of being what I call negative by de default, I was going to be positive by design. And that's why I created a conversation with Brian, because I wanted to fi find and highlight great people like you who are doing so many great things to change the world. You're changing lives, Don, because when you talk about relationships, when you write a book and we were talking before we went on, you're writing another book. Think about the 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 model, the the, the mentor that you are, the person who well, people are going to say, oh, Don Parker did this. Don Parker's a doctor. Oh, my gosh. I can probably do this or I can help my students. But I, I just felt like, you know, we were hearing so much negative about our, our profession. I'm like, no, that's not our profession. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things that are going on. We have a lot of things that we're asked to do. And we have a lot of great people doing great work. And I want to make sure that I highlight those people and put, give them a platform so you all can, you know, continue to change the world. And so that's why I started a conversation with Brian. And I really, again, appreciate you coming on. And then just my last question, how can people get in touch with you? I know you have a website um, if they Absolutely. need to. All right. Uh, yeah, you're right. Because I don't like for things to be a one and done. I really like to have relationships and ongoing conversations yeah. to get to know people and get to support them. So my email is dr.donparker at comcast.net. So that's um, Dr. Don Parker at Comcast.net. Don't forget the dot, dr. Dot Don Parker at Comcast.net. And my Twitter is at Dr. Don Parker one. And that's with no dot. So it's at dr. Don Parker one. And that's my Twitter handle. And uh, my website is drdonparker.com. And so people can also visit my website where I put up the dates where I'll be and, um, you know, have, you know, just a little bit about myself and the work that I do. It's an awesome website. I really like it. It's a great website. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. And so, yep, I just put a lot of things that I do on my website, on social media, just so 
I can do the same thing that you're doing, Brian, and empower educators, inspire them so that they can continue to change the trajectory of their students' lives. Well, Don, as I had said for these first these last two weeks, promoting you coming on my show, that you're going to bring the fire. And you, you literally brought the fire and behind you, you have fire behind you because I knew you were going to bring the heat. Um, but I, I do. I, we're going to bring the heat like June and July. Come to one yeah. of my seminars, come to my, one of my workshops. It, yeah. It's going to be engaging. It's going to be personal. It's going to hit in all of your learning styles and modalities because I really truly believe in giving people an experience when they come to one of my workshops and giving them what they signed up for. So they leave feeling empowered and not only entertained and educated, but uh, how do you say it? Um, edutained. They're edutained yeah. by the time yeah. they leave the workshop. Yeah. Well, that's important because people need to be make those connections and need to be engaged so that learning really sticks and they can take it back and really apply it to you know their their personal settings. So Don, again, thanks so much for coming on a conversation with Brian. You are wonderful and you know, good luck with everything that you do and keep in touch. Friends, on our next conversation with Brian, we're gonna have a special edition in two weeks. We're gonna have the best of a conversation with Brian where we're gonna have snippets of Don's conversation. We're gonna have snippets of um, Katie White and uh, Maurice McDavid and Tracy and Tracy Hewlin and Ann Bailey Lipset and um, who else do we have? Um, Esther Rodriguez Brown. We're gonna have a compilation of their talks with me in two weeks, and so stay tuned for that. But over these next two week two weeks, you'll see Don on Facebook. You'll see Don also on my LinkedIn profile. You'll see him on YouTube and on Twitter. And so until next time. Have a great week and Godspeed. Don, thanks so much. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you.